we are trying to know Christ. We are trying to know Jesus through the scripture. So it is a series. We are talking about knowing Christ. The first day I talked about the importance of knowing Christ. And if there was anything that we can remember from it, is that knowing Christ is knowing yourself because your identity is hidden in Christ. And I say that a lot of people are confused today because they're not trying to know Jesus. They think that they can find their identity in themselves. And I say that there's a lot of confusion today. There is a lot of problem today in terms of identity. People do not know who they are. People do not even know their gender. And I say that it is because we have rejected God. It's because we do not want to know God. And the more we are refusing to know God, the more confusion. It's going to be in our lives because we can only find ourselves in God. He created us. He made us. He know who we are. And if you reject God, you cannot know who you are. And you are just lost in yourself. If you find God, you have found yourself. If you found God, you have found yourself. You know, have you, have you noticed that more and more people are just talking about the government putting more money into the system? It's just about money. It's about, you know, putting more money in mental health, putting more money in, uh, in, in, in people suffering and all that. But what you realize is that the more money they are putting in, the more problem we have. The more drugs people are being, are being given, the more issues we're we, we, we having in terms of a mental, a mental health. Nothing, no amount of money will solve the problem until we come to know Christ. And it is the truth of God. You may reject that truth, that is your problem. We might be in the minority side of things, but the truth will never change. And the truth will remain the same. You reject Christ, you have rejected yourself. You get lost in yourself if you have lost Jesus. So knowing Christ is that important. It's so important that we know Christ. When we find ourselves in him, then we found our purpose. We found who we are. And today I just wanted to focus on the passions of Christ. The passions of Christ. Passion. What is passion? Passion is a strong and barely controllable emotion. But passion can also be the suffering and the death of Jesus. It's also called the passion. And we all have passions. We all have you know, passion. Understand that when you uncover the things that people are passionate about, when you discover the things that people are willingly, are willingly, want, you know, they are, they are, they are willing to give the time to. Things people are willing to give the energy. You find the, you know, you find the passion, you know, the passion. Whether it is hunting, you know, going on the, you know, cycling, going to the gym, you know, there are people who are so passionate about going to the gym, isn't it? And especially nowadays where it's just like, I can't miss a day in the gym. I can't, just can't. I can't miss it. Even though for 15 minutes, I just want to go in. I, you know, but the problem is, when you look at the, that passion of, 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 of the things that we do, you ask yourself the question, how much passion you do have for God? How much passion do you have for God? How many of the things you can give up for God? Yes, we can give up on the things, a lot of things, because we are passionate about, about football. We are passionate about our work. Some people are passionate. I know there are not a lot of people who are passionate about the work. They just work because they have to pay the bills. But there are a lot of people who've got passion, passion in, in anything else. The question is, when you, you know, when you find out what people are passionate about, then you find out about who they are. Yes, we all recognize passion when we see it. You cannot fake passion. You know that someone is passionate. When someone is passionate about you in a relationship, you just can't hide it. You know, you can't just fake it. You know when someone is, is, is passionate about you. When someone is passionate about you, he talks about you all the time. He thinks about you all the time. He will go extra mile for you because he's passionate about you. People are passionate about something. And when people are passionate about something, they can spend money. They don't care about the weather. They don't care about whether it's comfortable or it is uncomfortable. Question about money, weather, 
uh, circumstances are irrelevant when we are passionate about something. Have you seen people running in the rain? Have you seen people jogging when the weather is really bad? You look at them in your car, you're freezing in your car even though you don't have a, your, heat, your heat on. But you see someone running and jogging with, just with, a, you know, just with a, a vest. You go like, it's cold. And some Fridays and Saturdays, you drive around Union Street. In winter time, winter time, it's about one degree. Zero, minus one, minus two. At 10 o'clock, at 11 o'clock, you see young ladies, right? Walking and going to pubs and clubs with almost nothing on them. Then you go like, I'm freezing in my car. But they are standing there queuing before a nightclub. I say queuing. And one day we were driving with my wife. And my wife looked and said, why people can't queue to get into the church? If we people had to queue to come into the church, they will come. There's a queue. I'm walking away. I'm not, I'm not, I can't, I can't say. How come people are standing in the queue for I don't know 45 minutes just to get into a nightclub? And I'm telling you, just getting into something that will kill them and destroy them. People are ready to stand in the cold. But for something that will give them life, like a church, they're never going to stand. They're not even going to give, even when we give them a sofa, we say, you look, you're not going to sit on this. We're giving you a sofa, please. Just come and be comfortable. No, 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 no. I'm not going to the church. I'm not, I'm, you know, you see where, you see people, people's passion. And when you see how, how much people spend, the sacrifices that they make, then you understand where their passions are. Yes, passion is an amazing, inspiring, motivating, it's a powerful thing, you know, passion. Nothing great ever happened without the passion. No relationship will be fun without passion. Nothing great ever happened without passion. And I can tell you that without passion, you just can't achieve greatness. Athletes who, has broke, who have broken the record, passion drove them. I was reading about this um, um, great champion uh, who did, I think, how you call it? Those who swim. Do you call it natation? How you call it? Swimming. Yeah, okay, swimming, you know, it was, and I think he won something like 12 gold, gold medal. Uh, this American, do you know him? That guy, he started exercising when he was 11, and he was exercising for six days. He had a break on Sunday, and uh, every day for six hours, every day for six hours, just training, swimming, bike and all this stuff he was doing it since he was 11 and for the next 12 years every single day he exercised and he broke all the record that what passion does without passion you can't break any record without passion you just can't get anywhere we all need passion Passion drives you. It drives you. But not only passion drives you, but it also inspires others. Because people see how passionate you are about something. You inspire them. They want to do it. You want to do it. You know, I remember as I told you that I will leave the worship on my own. And then, bang, before I know it, Sister Mima sent me a video of Bobby singing as a nine-year-old nine child holding uh, a remote control and uh, trying to sing what I was, how I was singing. And Mima recorded it and sent it to me because when you do something with passion, someone is looking at you. Someone is being inspired. Someone wants just to do what you are doing. If I'm preaching here without passion, nobody will be inspired. But when you're doing it with passion, a lot of people will be inspired. Yes, we all, we all need passion that can drive us. Passion is what makes great things happen. Passion propels people to do great things. God created you to be a passionate person. You were made with the capacity for passion because God is a passionate God and he created you just like him. God made you to feel things deeply, to live passionately. 
That's what God wants you to do. And uh, the word passion, it, is, it comes from Latin. Paseo, which means to suffer. To suffer. When you have passion, you suffer. When you have passion, you pay the price. It doesn't matter what it costs. You just pay the price. Now, one thing that is evident is that when you look at the life of Jesus, what you notice is passion. That's why we are studying about Christ. What you see about Jesus is passion. And God wants you and me to be just like Jesus. He wants us to live life, life, life fully, abundantly, and passionately. How, how, how deep do you feel about things? How deep do you feel about God? How passionate are you about God? As I said, when you are passionate about God, you don't count the price. You don't count the cost. You don't see how much it costs you because you are just passionate about God. And this is what changes life. This is what's going to change someone's life. I just want to give you a few examples in the Bible to see how Jesus lived passionately. And in every example, you will see that Jesus lived passionately in different ways. The first one, Luke chapter 2, verse 46 to 49. The Bible says, before even I read, we know that Jesus, when he was 12, his parents, they took him to the temple for a feast. After the feast, they took their way back home. And the Bible said they walked two days. And after two days, they realized that Jesus was not with them. Imagine you went with your child in a city and then you went home. Two days later, you realize that, you know, when I was reading it, I went like, really, Joseph and Mary? Two days for you to notice that your son is not around. Can you imagine? There were two days that you don't notice. I just guess that they were just too busy, you know? Or if they were not busy, just this is just me guessing, they were probably, Mary was thinking, Joseph should have Jesus, or, Je um, um, you know, or Joseph was thinking that Mary will have, or Jesus will be with other siblings. You know, that's what I guess. But anyway, two days, then they realized that Jesus was not with them. Then they made a decision to go back where they left Jesus to see where Jesus was. And then there they are walking back. Imagine now you've walked two days home. Now you have to walk two days back to get your son. How angry would you be? They do not have cars like us. You can just drive and go and pick, you know, pick up your child. Uh, they do not have mobile phones where they can call and check for someone. They had actually to walk. Imagine you as a parent having to walk back two days just to find. And I'm sure as they were going, Joseph was looking at Mary and said, you should have been responsible for this. And Mary, you should have been responsible for this. I, what, 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 you know, how have we, how have we even done it? How did we leave our child? So they will, they will be talking and going. And then there they are. They go to the place where they found Jesus. Now listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says now. So it was that after three days, three days, they found Jesus in the temple. Sitting in the midst of the teachers. Both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him, all who heard Jesus, were asto astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And now listen. And he said to them, why did you seek me? Ha, that was rude. Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Listen to this answer. Why have you been looking for me? You know, dad and mom have been looking for you for three days. They found you. We are happy. We find you. But come on, what have you done this? You know, you should have been following us. And Jesus are looking at us and say, about, have you been looking for me for what? I was all right. I was okay. But you know why was he okay? The Bible says he was okay because he said, I am after my father's business. I'm about my father's business. This is what I came about to do. This is what I exist. This is the reason of my life. So when I'm doing my father's business, don't look for me. Don't worry about me. Don't call me. Don't send me messages. Don't Facebook me. Don't messenger me. Don't WhatsApp me. 
because I'm, I'm, I'm about my father's business. This is the passion that drove a man. At the age of 12 years old, he was so passionate about the father's business that he did not even care about what other young men would be doing. You see, you see a young man 12, but who live differently. But I want to tell you, because most of the time we want to copy people. Most of the time we want to do what other people are doing. And especially as parents, when we see other children, we want our children to be like, like those children, right? And, and what I hate most is for a parent to say, have you seen so and so? Have you seen so and so? Look at what they're doing. You know, like, like comparing. Jesus had no comparison. Jesus had no match. Jesus did not look like any of them. He was different. He was special. He was exceptional. And God wants you and me to be exceptional. God wants you and me to be different. And what makes you to be different is the fact that you are living passionately. You're not just going through life. You're not just going through the most, you know, the emotions. You know, sometimes you just do things because you've got to do it. You come to the church. Oh, it's Sunday. I'm just going to the church. It's Sunday. I'm just going to the church. And you're not looking at the time saying, well, Pastor, would you just finish this please so that I can just go but when you are passionate about something you just can't wait to go to the church on Sunday does that make it does that sound I write to you that when you are passionate about the things of God you just can't wait you know when is it Sunday oh I can't wait for Sunday oh tomorrow is Sunday and some people who even turn up to the church late because they've been they were not sure about the clothes the, what they're gonna wear you know, especially you wake up in the morning and you try this dress, you try that one, you try, oh, it's still not going well. And you take your time trying to find clothes. But actually, the question is why you, you did not try to do it the night before? Why did you not plan all these things? Because you are so excited. Because sometimes we go through the motions. Sometimes we just do things because we've got to do them. You know, when you are cooking passionately, the difference is the taste. But when you are just cooking because you've got to do it, then you miss some few things. When we live passionately, it, it makes a difference. But Jesus was passionate about the Father's house. My question to you is, how passionate are you about the Father's business? How passionate are you about God's business? When you look at God's business, when you look at the church, when you look at the things of God, how passionate are you? How passionate are you? The passions of Christ. He was about the Father's business. Are you passionate about the things of God? Jesus, the Bible says, he sat down. He was listening to the teachings. But he was also uh, uh, learning. But he was also answering questions. He was also asking questions. And you know the passion this way. You know the passion because people ask questions. You know the passion because you see people wanting to know more. You know, when someone comes to you and says, Pastor, I want to find out more, find out more about this, you know there is passion. Pastor, I want to learn this, you know there's passion. But there are some people who came to Christianity for 10, 15, 20 years. They just come and pray and go home. They never try to learn about anything. They don't want to learn anything about God. They don't want to know anything about God. They're not growing in the faith with God. Why? Because there is no passion. There is no passion. And God wants you and me to have passion today. The second example, it is still about Jesus. The Bible tells us that Jesus come into the city. He comes in Jerusalem. And as he comes to Jerusalem, he was welcomed. People sang for him. People sang song, Hosanna. Hosanna to the Lamb of God, Hosanna to the Son of David, and all that. People were singing, they were quite happy to see Jesus. And Jesus came into the temple. You know, when he came to the temple, what did he do? The Bible says, the Bible says and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of coats, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the, the changes money and overturned the tables and he said to those who sold those take these things away do not make my father's house a house of merchandise then his disciples remembered that it was written zeal for your house has has eaten me up look at what jesus is doing here jesus 
is coming into the temple. He sees, thing, he sees people doing what they were not supposed to do. The house of God became a supermarket. And I really believe that these things are still happening in the church. These things are still happening in churches, I have to say. Where you see merchandise. Where you see people selling things in the church. And I always say that if someone just brings something to sell in the church, please just don't do it. Don't do it. Because sometimes people say, oh, this is an opportunity for business. But sometimes it does not come from, from church members. Sometimes it comes from the leaders, comes from the pastors, where they are, sending, they, they are selling a merchandise. Have you been in a church where they are selling T-shirts? Where they are selling water? With like a blessed, I don't know how you call it, blessed water? You know, something like that. And people, as they walk out of the church, they will buy waters, they will buy something that they will keep in their house. And sometimes there's a promise of a healing that if you buy that, there will be a healing. And that's what Jesus found. He found out that the church was no longer a place where people were worshiping the true God. People were coming to, to buy and sell. It's so easy that for us to transform the church into something that God never intended it to be. But what makes a difference? What changes things? It's passion. And the Bible says that because Jesus was so passionate about the things of God, when he looked at it, he said, yes, if someone will hate me, let him hate me. If someone will say bad about me, he will say bad about me. But I am taking a whip. And I am whipping everyone. And the Bible says Jesus began to chase them away with a whip. Imagine what these people could have been saying about Jesus. Really? Is he the son of God? Is he proclaiming that he's the Messiah? Whipping people? Whipping people? You see, most of the time, we always think that God is a gentle God. But there's a time where God takes a whip. There's some time where God takes a whip. The Bible says that David said, your, your, your stuff, your road and your stuff, they comfort me. It's not just a gentle God, but it's a God when, when we are doing things that is, is not, it, they are not right, God takes a road and God takes, this, takes it a stuff and he begins to discipline us. And Jesus did exactly that. Why? Because he was driven by passion. When you come to the church, when you see the work of God, are you happy about it? Jesus was not happy. He was not happy about what he was saying. And there's a moment where we have to be angry, holy anger. Do you know there's such a thing as a holy anger? Do you know that? Yeah, what Jesus was expressing there, it is a holy anger. He was really angry. But he was angry for the right stuff. He was angry for the right stuff. There are moments where we look at the state of the church in general. We look at the state of things. We say, no, he cannot carry on this way. We've got to do something. Someone has to speak out. Someone has to say something. You know, we live in a, in a culture where we are not allowed to say things as they are. We live in a culture where we have to be politically correct all the time. And the worst is even in the church, we can't speak the truth because somebody will be offended. Because we are in this culture, we don't say things like this. It appears to be rude. It appears to be that. But the Bible says that what Jesus did, if he did it in our time, a lot of people would say, he's not the son of God. He's not the Messiah. But when he's driven by passion, he was willing to speak the truth. He was willing to take the weep. He was willing to do everything in his power to restore order in the church to restore order in the temple. And this is so important. Look at the life of the church. Look at the church. When you come to the church, your church, what do you see? Is there anything that you believe? No, 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 no. It cannot be this way. We've got to change things. That's what passion drives you to do. The third example that we find of Jesus, the Bible says Jesus is speaking. He's saying the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised to uh, be raised the third day the son of man must 
And I want you to notice that. Must suffer. Not the man of the, the, the son of man might suffer. The son of man must suffer. What Jesus was saying is, if something needs to be done, it's got to be done. If I have to be killed for people to get salvation, then I've got to do it. You know, that was, that's what passion does. Passion, it makes you do things not because you want to do them. Passion makes you do things because they got to be done. They got to be done. And by the way, when I gave you the example of, of Michael Pelps, it's not like every single day was waking up feeling like he needed to train. There are some days that he, had, he just had to do it because it's got to be done. There are moments where something needs to be done. And in the work of God, in the work of God, there is just something that needs to be done. That got to be done. You might not feel like it, but you said, I've got to do it. I've been telling you about prayers. I've been telling you about all these things that we do in the church. If we had to do things just because we feel like doing it, we're never going to do anything for God. And by the way, Jesus never felt like he got to die for you and for me. He never felt like it. Because remember that he asked the father if he can remove that cup away from him. He was telling the father, father, can you do it other, can you do it other way? That's what he was saying. The son of God. But it's got to be done. That's why he's saying that the son of man must suffer many things. There are moments where we are, when we are so passionate about God that we can accept suffering. We can accept for people to mistreat us. The problem we do have sometimes in the church is uh, as, as soon as we encounter the challenge, as soon as someone says something that we don't like, it's just like, I'm off, I'm off, you know, I'm out of this. But you don't do things because you want to do them. You do things because they got to be done. Because God wants somebody to do it. Can you see around you? You, you know, can you see in your life something that God wants to do through you? Something that God wants to do that you don't feel like doing it, but it's got to be done. I even think about evangelism. Sometimes we just, you know, we just don't feel like going out and doing it. But it's got to be done. Because remember, it's not about you. It's about him. It's about the purpose. It's about understanding the reason why we're here. Why do you exist? You don't exist for yourself. And believe me that there are a lot of Christians who we are still very, very selfish. We think about ourselves. We think about what we can have. We think about our, our time, what we can do. But we're not thinking about God. And when God is calling you for something else, you say, Lord, no, 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 Lord, I don't want to do it. Believe me. A lot of people think that when God wants you to do something, he will give you the heart to do it. That's what we always think. If that was the case, then he would have given Jesus the heart to do it. But Jesus did not have the heart to go on the cross. But he had to do it. There are moments where God will ask you to do something. You don't feel like it. It does not mean that it's not the will of God. It just means that you are fighting between your own passion, your own interest, with God, what God is asking you to do. And if it needs to be done, then it's got to be done. Jesus understood that, and he did exactly that. And the last example that I want to give to you about what Jesus did, he took care of God's people. The Bible says, but when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. This is another way just Jesus showed passion towards God's people. He saw people hungry. He saw people scattered. He saw people suffering. And the Bible says he was moved. He was moved. The question I ask is, sometimes we look at around us, we see people who are weary. We see people who are uh, sick. We see people who are distressed. We see people who are going through difficulties. The question is, can you have compassion for those people? Jesus was moved not because he had the ability to do something. He did it because he was, he was compassionate towards those people. What moves you to do something for God sometimes is when you look at the people, you say, Lord, can you use me? I just pray that somebody will see someone very sick. And just pray to God, Lord, give, can you give me the power to pray over this person and for this person to receive healing? And because you are crying out to God with compassion, God gives you that ability to 
pray for that person and for that person to receive healing. Because most of the time we think that God can only use so and so, but God can use each and every one of us if we are compassionate. If we are compassionate. There, there is somebody who wants to be served. There are people in the church who want to be served, who are just waiting for you to stand up and to do something. And God wants to use you with that passion. He wants to drive you. I want to just mention a few things that kept Jesus' passion fueled up. The first one the fuel for his passion came from what Jesus knew. What did he knew? He knew that he was the son of God. In other words, your passion will be fueled by knowing who you are. If you know that you are a child of God, if you, are, you know that you belong to God, then you know how you can live your life in a different way. He knew where he was going. The Bible says Jesus knew that he was going back to the Father. So he felt like his time was very limited. So he had to do something. You know, sometimes I look at people, I say, sometimes we think that we're going to live on earth forever. Some people think they are eternal. Or some people think that they've got plenty of time. Believe me, I remember when I was 22, I went to visit uh, someone who was in his 50s at the time. And believe me, at 22, when he was in his 50s, I find, I, I, you know, I look at that person, I felt like he was very old at 50. Say, this is very old. And then we were taking tea, and um, I had my teas, and I had three sugar. I like it sweet, sorry. But he did not take any sugar. And I said, why are you not taking sugar? He said, son, at my age, I should be taking less sugar. And he told me that, when you get your 40s, from that moment, you have to reduce your amount of sugar and all that. I was 22. Then I look and say, 40s, that's a long time to go. That's a long time. You know how old I am today? 49. It's, it has gone. I said, what? Oh, you clapping? Oh, I go, oh, glory to God. <laughs> glory to God. But I don't know where the time has gone. I really don't know. I was 22. I can still remember it as if it was yesterday. And when he was telling me, when you are 40, I was 22, and I went like, you know, in 18 years' time, that's a long time. You know what? I've gone past it without even noticing it. Poof, it's gone. And before you know it, I will be 65. Believe me, when I will be standing and say, I'm 65, oh, Pastor Charlie, it was like last year that you, 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 you told us about. Time goes really fast, my friend. And Jesus understood that. He lived passionately the things of God. Because he knew that he did not have enough time. You young men, young girls, you are here, you are 18, you are 17, 16. You feel like you've got plenty of time ahead of you to serve God. I can tell you if there is a, any best time to do the work of God is today. It's today because the reality is before you know it, you'll be a father of three children. You will be a mother of 15 children. Right, okay. We live in a different time. My mama had 12. We live in a different time. But before you know it, you're going to be a mother. Before you know it, you're going to have a family. I can't, you know, my daughter is 16 now. I just call her. It was like yesterday. You know, and that's, that's how you know you, you're old. Yeah, when you start looking at your children. Yeah, you go like, ooh, I'm really old. Right? Start having gray hair and all that. So time goes really fast. Serve the Lord passionately whilst you're still young. Serve the Lord passionately when you kill, you still can. Because the Bible says there will be a time where you can't even stand on your two feet. There will be a time that you won't be able, able to walk, but you will remember, Lord, when I had the strength, Lord, when I was a young man, Lord, when I was a young woman, Lord, I served you passionately. I've given it all for you. You're never going to miss that moment. That's why our brother Sylvester said that you can stand before God and say, Lord, I, I, want, I just want to remind you, Lord. You know when I was 18, Lord. You know what I gave to you, Lord. Lord, you know when I was 20. You know what I've given to you, Lord. You know, I don't know how many times. To be honest, there are moments where I go through struggle. Then I stand before God and I say, Lord, yes, I'm not perfect, but come on. Come on, can you remember? Can you remember all these things that we have done for you? There are people who have sacrificed the youth 
for God. They've lived the youth, not going to nightclubs, not doing all these things that young men does because they want to glorify God and they live passionately for God. And I want to tell you that God will remember you. God will remember you. You do not waste your time because time is of essence. Time is very short. Jesus knew that he was going back to the Father. Last yesterday, those of you who watch the news, they have seen this uh, former Newcastle player who just last year he went to, pl to play in Turkey and he was killed in the earthquake. They looked for him for about a week. They could not find They found the shoe and then they found him. And yesterday they took the body back uh, to Ghana, is it? They took the body back to Ghana. He's 31. His life is, is done. He was in the flat in the sixth or seventh floor and his clock, he called out. Who knows what's happening is coming tomorrow? Who knows? You know, when I look at these things, when did they happen? I say, Lord, I, I just, all these things, they fuel me to serve God because I just feel like, what life, what's the meaning of life if I'm not, I'm not serving God? Where is money? He was a football player, but somebody else will enjoy that money. Somebody else will take the money. Somebody else will take the house. He's gone. That's it. And that's it. It's, it's finished forever. It's never going to come back on, on earth. That's how our life is. When you understand that, you live like Jesus. It fuels your passion. You say, Lord, for this moment, for this time that I'm, I'm living my life, Lord, I want to I wanna serve you. When you know your purpose, you serve God. You serve God and you give yourself to him. Let me finish with these few things. God has promised you. The first thing he promised you, Jesus said, I'll tell you the truth. The truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done. And even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. In other words, anyone who believes in Jesus can live as passionately as Jesus did. Is Jesus? Yes, but he was also, also man. He had blood, flesh just like you. We all, we also can live like him. We also can live passionately. We can feel passionate about the things of God. The church the church of God, we can feel passionately. You can come to this place and say, Pastor, oh, I look, I, 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 need, I need to make sure that this place is clean. That is your passion. Pastor, I want to pray. I want to dedicate myself in prayer because I want to see revival. That is, that, is, that is your passion. You don't just come to the church like a visitor every single day. You know, sometimes you may be in this church for five years, for ten years, but you, you still feel like a visitor because you... You know, you, you're not passionate about it. You're not passionate about the things that we do. But Jesus said, you can do exactly what I'm doing. And that is the promise. And the last word, the Bible says, never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Serve the Lord enthusiastically. Be enthusiastic about when you're doing something. When I'm preaching, I have to be enthusiastic. When I'm praying, I have to be enthusiastic. When I'm coming to the church, I'm, I'm enthusiastic. Your enthusiasm, it's what will inspire other people. Somebody will ask you one day, I see you every Sunday you go to church, can you take me with you? Because he sees the passion. Someone will be inspired because of you, because of your passion. Can you make the decision today to connect with God, to let God fuel you up? Can you begin to leave with the passion that Jesus was living with? Can we just bow our head?